You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 8, 2014, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, contact dermatitis. Our presenter is Dr. Sharon Jacob. She's an associate professor of dermatology and the director of the Contact Dermatitis Clinic at Loma Linda University. Glad to be joined today by Dr. Sharon Jacob. Uh, Dr. Jacob is an associate professor of dermatology and the director of the Contact Dermatitis Clinic at Loma Linda University uh, in California. Um, Dr. Jacob is an expert in contact dermatitis. In fact, I, I think that's the name of your website, isn't it? Contactdermatitis.net or something? <laughs> yeah, I got that 10 years ago. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> fantastic because I'm sure that it would be hard to get today. <laughs> but, uh, I couldn't oh. believe no one had it. Yeah. Well, you've got it, and it's well deserved. Uh, anyway, welcome to conf- uh, con- con- conferences online allergy, Dr. Jacob. Perfect. Um, I'm using the um, panel, and the slides are not forwarding. You should be able to uh, just use your wheel. You've got control. You may have to to click on the slide or or use your keyboard. There you go. You got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, to start with some disclosures, um, I've been in the in the past two years. Um, now Coria has been bought by Valium, but um, I've also worked with Neutrogena and Johnson Johnsons, and I've been a speaker and an independent investigator for Smart Practice USA, and they make the true test. So we're going to talk today about what is allergic contact dermatitis. I want to hit on some practicals of patch testing uh, in terms of the systems, the pitfalls, and then some of the resources we have available. So that we're all on the same page, contact dermatitis can be grouped into, it's an umbrella term, uh, about 80, 85% of contact dermatitis is represented by what's called irritant contact dermatitis. About 20% is your allergic contact dermatitis, and then other um, variants which are much less common would be your contact urticaria and your protein um, allergic contact. So talking about contact urticaria briefly, um, because that could be an lecture in and of itself, this is an immediate type hypersensitivity reaction where you get a wheel and then flare, um, which is a hive followed by contact with certain agents. This is um, typically um, an immunologic event that is IgE-mediated. However, there is a non-IgE-mediated mechanism as well. The patient is usually previously exposed and sensitized, and you have preformed antibodies. There's release of vasoactive amines, such as histamine, and you can get a localized or generalized reaction. Um, The one that we think about most often would be your natural latex, and there's certain proteins in the latex that cross-react with certain fruit antigens as well, such as passion fruit, banana, and kiwi. Um, You could also get a contact dirty carrier to cow's milk, egg, potato, and seafood. One thing that we do um, get quite a few referrals in for um, contact urticaria, one of the things we want to make sure to do is that we're not looking most of the time for contact urticaria syndrome where you have the hives and the eczematoid um, reaction, the delay type in the same patient, which does occur. Um, But oftentimes we're just looking for the primary contact urticarial component. So for those patients, you would actually want to examine the patch test at about 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, because if you wait 48 hours to take the patches off and then an additional 48 hours to read the patches, the immediate reaction would be gone. So here's an example to um, a latex uh, reaction to a glove. So irritant contact dermatitis, again, it's 80% of your contact dermatitis group. There's a propensity for the hands, face, and eyes. It can happen to anybody. This does not have a prior sensitization phase. Um, There's an invocation of the innate immune system, so there are all cytokines involved. And this is a relationship between the skin's tolerance and chemical strength. So anything could be an irritant, such as um, if you were to think about bleach um, or if you were to think about chronic exposure to soaps. 
so that we can compare and contrast allergic contact dermatitis versus irritant contact dermatitis. Um, this is the slide for that. And allergic, again, is less common. It is a delayed type hypersensitivity uh, reaction requiring Th1 cells. Usually the antigen is um, lipophilic, and it's a low-weight molecular haptin. Prior sensitization is required, and there's an it, independent of concentration in terms of sensitization. So once the patient uh, is sensitized, even a small amount could elicit a reaction. And the way we diagnose allergic is through patch testing, whereas irritant, we don't use it to diagnose. Um, we don't use the patch test to diagnose irritant, but we can see irritant reactions during patch testing. And again, this is a, an injurious event to the keratinocytes, the skin cells. So in terms of allergic versus irritant, allergic tends to extend beyond the wells where we put the chemical because we're, we're invoking a response and bringing T cells in, whereas irritant generally is well demarcated to the area. Um, in terms of the reaction, you can get macular erythema in both allergic and irritant, um, but with allergic you tend to get more induration, you get papules forming vesicles, and sometimes bulla. Whereas with irritant, you can see a follicular reaction with some of the metals, or you can see um, some scaliness to the surface. One of the main um, features that helps differentiate the two is the symptoms. For allergic, you often will have itch, whereas for irritant, they, the, the tendency is to talk about a burning feeling. In terms of the latency of reaction, um, irritant's going to peak between 24 and 48 hours, whereas allergic is going to peak between 72 and 120. So during the patch test, if the patient has an irritant reaction, when you take the patches down, you might see that early reaction at its peak, but by the 96th hour, it will be resolving, whereas allergic will content, continue to crescendo over that window. So this is an example of irritant contact dermatitis. This patient has been lip licking. When you actually have the patient put their tongue out, the, the demarcation line um, of the vermilion border may be slightly effaced, but you'll see their tongue can actually reach these outer limits. Here's an example of an irritant contact dermatitis where the patient has used ammonium persulfate to bleach their hair and has an uh, injurious event to their scalp. Allergic contact dermatitis, again, is the delayed type hypersensitivity reaction requiring T cells. That was a patient who um, is a cement worker who is allergic to chromates that I had seen in Miami. It, again, is a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction that is in three phases. So the first phase is the sensitization. The second phase is the challenge or re-exposure. And the third phase is resolution. So this is an example, actually, of psoriasis, but I really like this this um, cartoon. And here we see um, the antigen penetrating the epidermis. We see the dendritic cells um, capturing that antigen, taking it into the lymph node, and educating the T cell. The T cell, no, no longer naive, goes into um, the bloodstream, starts going through the lymph node, and it can um, induce cloning. And then that T cell can emigrate into the skin and cause a localized cytokine reaction. So the sensitization phase can take 7 to 21 days. Most people say that you will not see a reaction the first time you're sensitized. That, for the most part, is true. However, if you've got a lot of poison ivy on your skin, for example, toxicodendron, you might not be able to get that antigen off, and it would continue to initiate a response every day until the skin turned over. So you could potentially have a reaction on the first time for that. So the antigen, again, penetrates the epidermis. For the most part, it's covalently bonded to keratinocytes. The metals um, don't covalently bond. Um, recognition by the dendritic cells and then presentation to um, the uh, T cells, and again, cloning. And that's when memory occurs. Now, once you have memory, um, it takes um, the antigen comes back, you get a challenge. It takes approximately 48 to 96 hours to recruit the memory T cells and start secretion of your IL-2 and interferon gamma. An interesting um, report by Moed back in 2004, they looked at clinically normal skin 21 days after patch testing. And this was um, the actual patch test, test site that they biopsied. And there was an increased expression of CCL 
27, which suggests that those um, markers remain in the skin in case there's re-exposure so that there's a, a primed response or a quicker response. So challenge leads to inflammation, and you can actually get a dermatitis at the site of exposure and prior exposure. So this lady that I'm showing here, I patch tested her for hand dermatitis, and she was allergic to nickel. She got a response on her back that looks very much like what we're seeing on her chest to the nickel. And when I asked her, you know, are you wearing pendants? Are you, you know, what, what could have been that exposure? It turned out that um, she had used front clasping bras uh, 10 years ago, and she hadn't worn them since. But this reaction on her chest was not there at the time of patch testing. It came up as a recall response when we put the androgen on her back. So when she got the flare on her back, this came up as well, which helped us link the clinical scenario. So the next step would be resolution. Macrophages remove the allergen. You get loss of antigen stimulation and resolution. That's why avoidance is the mainstay of therapy. There are some cases where there's an inability to remove the antigen, such as tattoo pigment. This is a mercurial that has been used um, to make the red pigment, and you get chronic stimulation. The other place where I have seen um, more of a granulomatous response in which the body doesn't, and I think I have a picture of this later, is not able to clear the reaction would be um, with gold. So approach to the patient, the first part is to get history of exposures, location, 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 it's just like real estate, um, the geographic clues are extremely important. And then in terms of deciding what to patch test and which allergens. So who should be patch tested? Anybody with a new onset dermatitis should be considered, but generally we don't patch test somebody until they've had their response for about two months. If we go too early um, and we test them, we may find a lot of um, actually inconsistent results because they may not be um, able to have a true positive reaction. We might get a false negative. So generally somebody who's um, progressed or, or deteriorating in terms of their atopic dermatitis or psoriasis or their new onset but it's been consistent and persistent. So increasing total body surface area Specific um, body sites, for example, the eyelids and the hands are often good indicators that a contact allergy could be involved. We see disc hydrotic eczema, a good portion of those um, have a nickel or a cobalt allergy. Con uh, chronic stasis dermatitis um, that is, is getting an eczematous change could be one of the medications used to treat, um, for example, a steroid or an um, uh, antibiotic if they're having ulcers. Adult onset eczema, uh, photodistributed reactions, and then again, any, uh, um, any dermatitis which is recalcitrant to standard therapies. So sometimes the allergen source is apparent. These are examples of paraphenylene diamine, which is added to black henna tattoo. We've seen in the literature down to 10 months, um, children, and they're getting um, blisters and um, scarring. This is a four-year-old who got a Batman uh, a black henna tattoo and ended up with a permanent discoloration of their skin. This is um, obviously um, so this is obvious that um, it's on the buttocks. But what is this? So this actually could be a couple of things. It could be irritant contact dermatitis to a cleaning supply um, solution that has been applied to the toilet or to the varnish or um, the plastic of the toilet seat. And this is a, an allergy to the varnish, the colophony-based varnish on the toilet seat, but you would want to consider ir irritant as well. So in terms of the history, sometimes the patient will tell you, you know, two weeks ago I was running through the bushes and camping, and they'll have this nice linear array of vesicles, which would be consistent with a toxicodendron um, exposure. This is a patient whose distribution mimicked the foam that was in her walking braces. So sometimes it can be um, indicative. This is a patient who this is uh, their belt buckle has been um, rubbing on their skin. They're nickel allergic. This is peri umbilical. This is a patient again that I showed earlier that has a chromium dermatitis, uh, a cement worker. This is a patient that we saw who had formaldehyde allergy. This was a good teaching case for me. Um, she was allergic to um, the formaldehyde that was in the leather in her shoes. We prescribed her a steroid, had her um, wearing rubber shoes with socks, and she got worse. 
Um, when we had her come back, I had prescribed her a steroid, and she had actually had been very sensitive to formaldehyde and the formaldehyde releasers. And the pharmacist had um, uh, had actually changed out her prescription and given her a generic which contained formaldehyde. So she ended up getting worse. So you just need to be um, cautious in prescriptions as well. This is a patient who's allergic to bacitracin. Um, this is a biopsy site. And you can see the extension of the um, papules beyond the, the site of the um, application. Here's a patient that's allergic to paraphernaline diamine. He's been dyeing his hair. Obviously, he's not putting the dye in his hair, but there is a volatility to hair dye chemicals. So if you can smell it during the hair dye process, that chemical is in the air and has got into contact with all parts of the, the skin. Um, the thing with the eyelids is that it's much thinner skin, so you do get some absorption. Um, we highly recommend patients with this type of reaction stop dyeing their hair with a paraphenylene diamine based um, hair dye, they could use one of the Goldwell, which is um, actually lead-based. There's some other, uh, other options as well. Um, a lot of times these patients do not want to stop dyeing their hair. If that is the case, they should use a very thick emollient over the eyelids, like zinc paste during um, dyeing. But again, dyeing practicing should be um, encouraged to be um, stopped. Lyorel is a um, fragrance allergen that has a lot of different sources. Allergy was first reported in 1984. It's used in fabric softeners, surface cleaners, shampoos, soaps, and in a lot of deodorants. So um, does anybody know what kind of deodorant this patient was using? Do you think it's a stick, a roll-on, or a spray? Do I need to turn the mic over to you guys? No, no, no. Oh, uh, sorry. You should be able to hear us. Okay. We, we've had a few a few muttered responses. <laughs> I wonder what was roll on. A roll on. No, this is actually a spray. So the um, you see all these peripheral dots. This is the spray zone. So this is a very nice picture for a spray, um, spray deodorant. And the other thing which is very nice about this picture, there is a um, central pallor or a slight sparing of the vault. With irritant contact dermatitis, the inverse is seen. So if you're irritated by one of the deodorant um, uh, uh, ingredients, then the central portion is usually more erosive and irritant and spared because of dilution by sweating in allergy. So it's just one of those clues about sparing areas. This is a patient that is allergic to paraphenylene diamine. She had not dyed her hair for over a decade. Um, she presented with um, a contact urticarial type reaction. And this is why we, we do discourage hair dyeing practices in people who are starting to get facial swelling, because anaphylactic type reactions have been reported to paraphenylene diamine um, in heavy users of dye. So she had gone to the dentist. She had told the dentist and everybody else that she was allergic to paraphenylene diamine and that she was not to have any ester anesthetics um, applied to her. And they said, don't worry, it's lidocaine. And then somebody applied a benzocaine gel prior to the injection. They walked in, they put the gel on her gum, and this was a secondary um, uh, reaction to the benzocaine because of its cross-reactivity to the paraphenylene diamine. So just be aware of those important cross-reactions. So in terms of prevalence and cost, contact dermatitis costs in, this is back 10 years ago, um, there were 72 million patients per year and costing about $1.9 billion a year. And we think that this is actually doubled at this point. Um, patch testing is cost effective and, can, and in those numbers could save, and this study has not been redone, but could have saved about 40 to $90 million. So patch testing is the gold standard. Um, it is underutilized. If you look at the American Contact Derm Society, 750 members, about 52% are in North America. 60% of the members practice comprehensive, which is when you make up your own allergens. And of the 240 comprehensive um, dermatology patch testers, um, that's about 1% to 2% of dermatologists. So it's, it's very low. Allergists are performing the true test and comprehensive testing, but we don't have as much data on their um, cross-section as we do the dermatologists. 
The dermatologists, about 74% are using true tests in practice, but usually less than five patients per month. So how do we improve our patch test efficacy when the source isn't obvious? One, select the right patient. You want a high index of suspicion, selecting the right chemical system, um, testing the patient to their products, but not unknown. So if people come in with a bunch of plants, I don't put the plants on the patient without knowing what they are. Um, and then also to give resource information as well. So this is a slide that just talks about the different kits that are available. The Hermal Trolab came through the AAD in the 1990s. That had 20 allergens and had about a 15% capture rate. The True Test back in 2003 had the 24 chemicals on it, 23 allergens and a negative control, and that was set to capture about 24%. And then if you looked at the North American Standard 65, um, that was capturing about 75%. So the more allergens you test, the greater chance you are to uh, select one that is relevant. In terms of selecting a system, the True Test now has 36 um, components. One is a negative control. It is FDA approved in adults. It comes with handouts. You don't require a lot of training in terms of staff. Um, the chamber, um, however, you could get an increased number of relevant allergens, but it's not FDA approved, and you do have to make up your own chambers. So this is the true test. It is a biological um, device. It does go through testing to make sure that it's um, stable across different environments. Here's the true test being applied. And there's a lot of different other um, standard patch test allergens available. Allergies, chemo technique, and Trolab are three different sources. This is um, us making up a patch test. This is one of the IQ chambers. Um, this is thin chambers. These are aluminum, and we're putting the chemical components into those wells. And here we've placed them on the patient. So um, these obviously are adult patients. So we want to use the history to direct allergen selection. We want to look for clues, where did the dermatitis begin, what sites were involved, and then consider allergens known to be associated with locations. For example, if we see eyelids, you want to think about fragrance, nickel, formaldehyde. If you see hand dermatitis, you want to think about quaternium-15, which is a formaldehyde releaser, and cocomidopropyl betaine, which is a detergent. You want to document current active dermatitis, and we photograph the patient before and during the patch test so we can um, discuss where, how their um, dermatitis is evolving. So in terms of approaching the patient, you want to um, history identify exposures. You want to look for temporal relationships. Remember, in pediatric patients, you've got a much smaller area, so you have to be more selective. Now, there's a lot of different schedule options. We talk about the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and while I didn't know Yadison, in the 1800s I was told that um, by one of my mentors that his clinics were Monday and Wednesday and Friday, and that's why he did the patch test that way. But it worked out to be the best intervals for detecting a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction, so that was um, fortunate. Um, but you can do a Monday application. You could do a Wednesday application, remove them on Friday and read them on Monday. That's actually my favorite. Um, it gives a little bit of a longer read um, go, going that extra day. Or you can do a Tuesday application, Thursday removal, Friday read. Um, that's a much tighter window. Um, sometimes we do that on our atopic children who have flares during um, the, and then we'll actually bring them back on the Monday as well, who, who may have flares of their atopic um, dermatitis during the patch test. So performing the patch test, we put the, um, the patches we think are going to be most relevant on the patient, and then we try to put um, their personal care products on as well, either their lotions, their, um, their makeup products, and sometimes we put components of things that they've been exposed to, for example, bras, um, swimsuit, gear, uh, shoes. This is a bra component on the right, all the different layers of the bra. And we were able to diagnose the patient with recalcitrant um, areola dermatitis. Um, and she was actually considering going on cyclosporin. It was um, so severe. So you have the patient remove at 48 hours to get the patches off. You look to see if the original dermatitis sites are flaring, and then you have them return. How can you further optimize the patch test? So shower before the patches are placed. Um, don't shower while the patches are in place for the first 48 hours. I generally, because uh, of mistakes I made in the past, have patients that have a lot of body hair shaved three days 
prior. Um, I've shaved them the day of the patch test, but oftentimes they can get um, reactions, like razor burn type reactions under the patch, and that can make it difficult to read. You want no cream on the back the day of the patch test, no steroids on the back for seven days before the patch test. No oral corticosteroids um, ingested less than two weeks or IM less than four weeks. Now, this is optimal, but um, I do see transplant patients that are having allergic contact dermatitis, and I feel that if they are having their reaction while they're on their attack or limus in their cell set, um, I can potentially get a positive reaction. Yes, I might miss some of the ones that are less relevant or less intense, but we have been able to detect important allergens. So if a patient is on steroids for lupus or steroids for something else we and still having their dermatitis, we generally don't take them off. Um, no sun or UV light on the tested area because that blunts the dendritic cells and makes it um, more difficult. Um, you can get false negatives. So again, we're going to take the patches off at 24 to 48 hours. We're going to mark potential positives. These could also be irritants that, again, will decrescendo at the 96-hour point. Uh, the second read, which is the 72 to 96 or the 120, if you have them come back on the Monday, you want to touch the patient. You're looking for induration. On darker skin types, it's difficult to see erythema sometimes. So people will walk in, they'll say, oh, I don't see a reaction, and the eyes are all negative. But you definitely want to touch the patient. So the way we do that is you, we go to Staples and we get this fluorescent highlighter. We mark around the squares, we turn the lights off, and we use the, uh, the woods light, the black light, to illuminate. That way we can't see erythema anyway. And then we touch the patient, and the ones that are more indurated are the ones that um, are, more po are positive. So this is just showing kid. I oftentimes draw next to them so they know what I'm drawing on their back because they don't like me drawing without telling them what I'm doing. So in terms of reaction grades, Macular erythema is when there's redness that you can't feel. These can still be clinically relevant. These can occur early or they can occur late. So you could have a very, very late 120-hour uh, read that is mild erythema, but their reaction, their dermatitis, might become more intense. And that is an important sign. Um, for a 1 plus reaction, you're starting to see a little bit more induration. You should be able to feel that reaction. For level two, you should get papules or vesicles in the patch, but you're starting to see, and this is what I use for number two. I know we have uh, three grades, you know, the macular erythema one, two, and three, but in my book, I have a hard time getting to a two if the area, if the reaction is not going beyond the well. So if you look at this one in the lower part here, it's extending past the well. So this one I would give a two plus two. I generally wish it was 1.1, 1.2. I feel like I'm voting at the Olympics. You know, that'll be a 1.5. I just can't give a 2. I'd be a really bad judge for, for uh, skate, ice skating or something like that. So this is a 3. This is a bullet's reaction. This is a paraphenylene diamine reaction. You can see extension well beyond the site. This one on the bottom is a thimerosal reaction. This patient was so excited to have this reaction. Unfortunately, it wasn't relevant to her dermatitis, but she was convinced it was going to be because it was so exuberant. This is the one I was talking to you about earlier. This is a granulomatous reaction to gold. I tend to ask people if they have a keloid history, if they do. Um, I tend to be on the more assertive side. If they're having a bullet reaction, I will inject the site on their back um, and not, um, not I will treat that to make sure we don't extend and, and potentially end up with one of these. Um, I've had three of these in the last 12 years, and um, one of them had to be cut out. Even with injections of the intralational catalog, we couldn't get it to come down, so had to go and do surgery. So there are variations with a patient. within a patient. You can get macular erythema. These were palpable. These are 1+. Again, you want to look to the original dermatitis sites to see if those are flaring. This is a patient who's got a 2 plus to nickel, 1 plus to chromate, and negative to cobalt. Here's a 2 plus reaction um, to, um, I think this was a, a fragrance. I can't remember right now. But this, this is well beyond the site. This is flowing over. And in this corner here, I accidentally um, cut this off because I wasn't photographing this. But this um, has a white scaly hue to it, and that was an irritant reaction. So you want to be aware of false positive reactions. 
This is cobalt. These are the blue dots I put um, for just identifying the square. But these are the cobalt blue of the um, element being oxidized in the follicular pore. So this is the eccrine um, ostia, and you get an irritant reaction. Cobalt is probably one of the most commonly overread positives, so you want to be aware of that. Sometimes irritants can be clinically relevant, but most of the time these are not. Here's another cobalt. You can see the blue hue. These are irritants from metals. And again, you see that scaling that um, this is a 96-hour read where the irritant dermatitis is getting better, and they had ulcerated at first. This is angry back. Oftentimes, I have the patient sit here for at least another 30 minutes because nothing is readable. But this is when we've taken the patches down. Want to be aware of false negatives. This is probably the worst thing to have in patch testing. So sometimes it happens because of improper contact with an allergen. The patient removes them. The patches fell off. Improper read. Uh, presentation delay. Um, gold, steroids, and bacitracin can all come up at 96 hours. But if you only read them at 48 hours when you take them off and don't do that second delayed read, you could miss those important allergens. In terms of visual versus palpation, I can't tell you the number of people I've worked with who walk in, take a look, say, ah, there's nothing there. Sorry, it's not contact dermatitis. And they walk out. And if they had touched the patient, they could see that the skin was much more indurated over some of those sites. Irritant reactions, um, the punctate purpura um, can also be an improper reading. But I think the main thing, the way I, I think about this, is what I call my Bunker Hill um, concept. So um, if you have clinical suspicion that this is still a contact dermatitis, um, allergic contact dermatitis, even if you have a negative test, I will retest what I think, um, and I'll be more specific. And if I've tested them on the back, I'll put my new tests on the arms. So in Bunker Hill, we have um, the troops were told to go and take over a hill. They did not know which was Bunker Hill. They thought they did, and they went back to a different hill where they knew um, before. But unfortunately, troops were waiting for them there. Had they gone to the new hill, they wouldn't have um, been defeated. So what does that mean? Well, I think about the troops of the T cells. Here we're asking them to go to your back where you put chemicals. And this is a naive site. But they don't know how to go to the back. So rather than go to the back, they completely ignore command. And they go to the original site of the dermatitis. So rather than going in the back and telling you, yes, we have a nickel dermatitis, they go to the hands. So if the hands, for example, got worse, but we have no positive reaction on the back, um, I that's we know we've got the chemical, but we've got a false negative. So what do we need to do? We need to be very aggressive and make sure we're watching for recall areas. If it's the hand dermatitis, treat with a mid to high potency steroid and redirect those troops. Tell the troops, you're not fighting the battle of the hands today. You've got to go find that new hill that we're trying to attack, so redirecting them. Use your steroids. Use your antihistamines. So then once we have, a, uh, have a, the last day, we say, was the patch test useful? At pre-education, we should have discussed, and at the end um, of the read, the t discuss the types of allergy in the skin. That This is a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction that we're looking for. It should take more than 72 hours to, re um, to show itself. Contact or to carry it, again, 30-minute window. And I'll actually do what I call a tap test. So I've got the chemicals on the patient. I'll tap them. And you won't believe the number of patients can say, it's that one. You take that one down, and sure enough, there's a hive under it. Um, did we get a positive reaction and a rash that worsened? That is what we're hoping for. A positive reaction that didn't mean anything, that's not what we're hoping for, but it can be information, or a negative reaction. So in terms of um, post-patch test education, we want to do clinical relevance determination. Again, does the dermatitis correlate with an allergen? And it's better if the patient gets worse from a clinical standpoint um, of their dermatitis during the patch test, because then we have a nice correlate. Um, this idea that they shouldn't get worse is not correct, because if we're putting the very chemical that elicits their dermatitis on, their dermatitis should get worse. So um, reviewing labels of products, answering questions and other specifics about routine exposures, 
And then in terms of counseling, using the CARD and the CAMP programs, do you guys use those? Yeah, I think we had an affirmative. Yes, perfect. So these are just comparing CARD and CAMP. CARD is supposed to be, um, it's getting um, overhauled, and I think it's going to be free um, at the end of the year. And then CAMP is available through the ACDS. So CARD was developed by Jimmy, Jimmy Yanianis at um, Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. It was the first program of its kind. They do have an iPhone, iPad, iPod, all the eyes um, applications, which allow you to um, walk around with it and take it to stores with you and keep a diary. The CAMP program, again, is by the American Contact Derm Society. And the way that it works, if you guys are all familiar with it, I won't burden you with it, but you put the chemicals in that um, you're concerned about through the database, and it will allow you to print a shopping list. One of the nice things about the um, CAMP is that, and both actually now, is that you can email it to the patient so you don't have to print out an 80-page packet of all the things they can use. But the point of this is to generate a product list of the things they can use, a shopping list, and to give them a list of potential exposures to their allergen so they can avoid them. I think we have to go through a few questions here at the end. Hopefully you have all these in your slide if anybody doesn't know how to um, use these. Does anybody have any questions before we get to the end here? I would like to give you at some point, I don't know if you have time later in the year, but uh, a pediatric one because the um, we can get more into some of the allergens and exposures in clinical presentations. So I don't know if your whole year is booked out. I usually give this talk in the beginning of the year. It's just a basic one, and um, I'd, I'd like to give you more of the some of the other pearls as well. So this is talking about how to use a safe list. Let me see. I think Dr. Dowling can contact you later about that. Yeah. Or if there's something else that you specifically um, are interested in. Trying to forward through all of this. Sorry. This is really basic. If you already know how to do it, I won't bother you with that. But I want to ask you the questions. OK. So the gold standard test to confirm allergic contact dermatitis is A, a prick test, B, serology, C, clinical history, or D, a patch test. Patch test. Great. So it's wrong in here. It should be patch test. I'm sorry how that came up. <laughs> Which of the following is true about irritant contact dermatitis? It is a delayed type uh, type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. B, it decrescendos in the patch test period. C, clinically it may appear beyond the area of exposure. And E, it has a rate-limiting step of sensitization. B, yes, B is in boy. And then, oh, sorry. So a 45-year-old lady presents with a one-week history of pruritic, scaly, erythematous thin plaques on her hairline and eyelids. She tells you that she knows it's not her hair dye because she's been using it for years and this just happened. You tell her, A, it could very well be the hair dye and she's become sensitized to a chemical in the hair dye. Or you agree with her and refer her to somebody else? I heard B. Good job. No, I was just kidding. So yes, <laughs> A is the answer. But the thing on this, why this is in here, besides being a, a little bit um, funny, is that we have a lot of patients with hair dye reactions. And early on, my first year of practice, um, I had a lifeline to David Cohen at NYU. And he'd say, call me for anything. And I called him up and I said to him, I have a patient, we've had a bullish reaction to one of their components, and I said, and they're telling me there's no way it's that, and they're not going to avoid it. And before I said anything else, he said, it's paraphenylene diamine and hair dye. And I said, you're right. He said, it's one of the hardest things to give up. So it's important to explain to people that um, sensitization can be a process that, yes, can take 21 days, or it could take 21 years. And it could be the thing that you've used over and over and over, and at this point your skin just isn't tolerant to it anymore. So we have to find alternatives. 
And then I have, uh, I've had a busy five years. I have, uh, this is, this is um, my, my two-year-old on the right, but I have a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a, and a two-year-old now. But it's been, uh, and I, I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of your program. It's wonderful that you allow me to commute in this way because uh, this is my other life. <laughs> so if you have any other questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, anybody have questions? All right. Dr. Jacob, thanks so much. That was a great talk. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.